Right. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the first breakout session um, workshop of the Academic Libraries North Conference. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to run through some quick housekeeping. Uh, so questions will be taken at the end. Feel free to either pop them in the Zoom chat um, or to raise your hand and we'll come to you for you to ask your questions on mic if you prefer. Um, the whole session is being recorded and you have the option to turn on closed captioning within Zoom. So just at the bottom where it's uh, the CC icon and live transcript, you can turn that on yourself if you'd like captioning. Um, and also just briefly, um, our code of conduct. So we're asking all delegates to abide by the code of conduct, which can be accessed via the delegate brochure or the ALN website. Um, we want ALN 22 to be an enjoyable experience for everyone. So if you see anything inappropriate, feel free to um, fill in the web form in the code of conduct or drop us an email and we'll pick that up. Um, okay, I'm now going to hand over to Shirley Yeoward Jackman um, from the University of Liverpool and a Philip trustee for her workshop, Space to Talk, Space to Reflect, Building a Team to Support Academics with Decolonisation. Over to you. Thanks. Thank you very much um, for your kind introduction and for inviting me to speak today. Really, really looking forward to this. Uh, it's been a challenging few uh, weeks for me. Uh, I won't go into the details, but uh, enough to say that it's just good to at least be able to be here. So this is a really uh, important topic, I think, that's, that uh, I've been engaging with um, and one that I'm, I'm really excited about. I'm just going to share my screen uh, and see if we can... Uh, Yes. Right, so just let me see. We can make sure you can see all this. Okay, so hopefully you can see my screen now. Someone can just confirm that for me. Yep, that's great. Yeah. Perfect. Yep. Right, so um, I'm just going to start by just talking a little bit about um, what happened. And um, so, you know, I'm talking here about academic liaison library. Many of you probably will be very aware of it. Uh, this particular project that we're going to kind of explore together and see how how it might help you, or or maybe even you might be doing something similar. For all I know, um, but essentially we're a, a team of academic liaison librarians. You know what we do: teaching, learning. Uh, research support, but um, also obviously teaching uh, uh, embedded on, 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 on teaching modules and, and working with our, our skills, um, academic skills service as well, know-how, uh, and then building relationships with, with academics um, and, and others, actually students and, and, and others, and then obviously keeping everybody um, up to date on service delivery, being that kind of go between uh, the library and the academic staff uh, and, and others to ensure that, that, that service delivery is, is good. Um, and so this project that we started, which is called Exploring Decolonization, um, a, works, a workshop series, really came about when we wanted to try to start dealing with um, figuring out how to uh, start the process of supporting academics to decolonize the curriculum, which has become a strategic objective for the institution and uh, the University of Liverpool. And the academic, um, what we did was we created an academic liaison librarian decolonization project team. And I think I'll talk a little bit about that in the lessons learned, hopefully, uh, to just kind of just uh, uh, highlight that but that that involved um some people that you may know so uh obviously myself but J zelda chatton um uh john wright uh and before john it was nicola gregory um who was uh, on the team and uh so so we've had you know this this little small little nucleus of academic years and librarians that's leading the, the, the project and then um what we were doing was looking at how do we uh, develop, try to create um, a team of liaison librarians as opposed to just looking at how to champion it. 
how do you have champions? Because often what happens is it's one or two people who are leading the charge um, and it's not actually rolled out as something for the entire team. So what we wanted to do was to look at how we could do that. So we look at how, how do we develop um, the knowledge of our academic uh, liaison librarian team about decolonization? How do we develop within them a level of confidence so that feel they can engage with academics about decolonization? How do we go about creating a safe space to have sustained and trusted dialogue um, with, with them so that they feel as though they can actually be or their authentic selves and, and actually uh, explore uh, without feeling judged? How do we help them to explore the barriers and opportunities that that exist uh, when you start on a project like this? And how do you develop a shared team understanding of how we can support decolonization within our, our library uh, and, and specifically within our role um, in terms of supporting academics uh, and indeed students, really. So, <coughs> One of the things that I think we want to do at the moment is kind of think about decolonization and what does it mean. So can I ask that you put that first um, poll in for me, please? Yep, no problem. And give everyone a chance then to answer that. Uh, and then the other one as well that's there, the second one. So these polls are around kind of, you know, these are the kind of poll that we would have shared with the team um, as we started on this journey. And we started to kind of figure out what it meant and how people were feeling. Because really we we're trying to give people a bit of space to kind of start to think about, you know, how, where they are in the process and actually let them know that it was okay, wherever they were, it was fine. It, it didn't matter. Some people were going to be much further along the journey than others. And what we needed to do was to just understand where everybody was um, and have a team approach where we could all be supportive of each other. So hopefully you've had a chance to answer those questions now. So here we go. How much knowledge do you have about decolonization? Moderate knowledge, good knowledge, for little knowledge. So, you know, to some extent, this is um, this is probably better, um, I think, um, in many ways, but it's an indication. Nobody's saying that they've got good knowledge. Well, some people are, but there's a few people that relatively few, the majority of people are in that um, moderate knowledge and little knowledge uh, about decolonization. And so um, I think, you know, there's always, there's work to be done. And so let's also have a look at the, at the next slide. So how confident do you feel about your understanding of decolonization in the curriculum? So you can see here, it's interesting how that shifts um, we've got 47% here, uh, a slightly confident, not confident at all, 12%. And this is what, what we were doing in this, by, by doing these um, this way, uh, this way of, of helping people to kind of explore this. Is it helps you to start thinking and reflecting on where, you, where you're sitting in that and therefore maybe what you might, might need or want to do to try to, to see. Good to see that we've got, um, you know, 26% there fairly, or 25 gone down, uh, fairly confident. But what, what I'm trying to say is, is that you can see there is this kind of um, range, isn't there, within our teams or within our organizations. Certainly it was the case for us. There was this range. And by giving this opportunity in an anonymous way to kind of just say, this is where I'm at, you know, I'm being honest, this is where I'm at. That was really, really um, helpful, I think, uh, and gave people a feeling, a sense that they could um, be honest with the situation. And so then one, one of the big things that we did, the next thing that we did was to start thinking about how can I, or how can we start helping people to move along and start thinking about what decolonization means? Because there's a lot of things about decolonization, isn't there? Um, a lot of ways in which, and there's lot, quite a lot of pressures um, around how people think about it. Some people feel very uncomfortable talking about decolonization and, uh, and, and feel as um, have a 
specific perspective about what decolonization means and tend to think of it as being something where you take you're taking out something you're taking away something um from the academy removing something because you know they're bad um or or they're not right and they're not you know reflective and i think um i just want you to listen to this it's about we've got about eight minutes on this so i'm just going to put this on and let you just listen to it and i'd like you to listen quite intently because afterwards you're going to go into breakout rooms and have a little bit of a discussion uh, about this and what it means um in terms of decolonization does it have any implication or how does it relate to decolonization I'm a storyteller, and I would like to tell you a few personal stories about what I like to call the danger of the single story. I grew up on a university campus in Eastern Nigeria. My mother says that I started reading at the age of two. Oh, shoot. Sorry. I apologize. It's my fault. I saw something on my screen and I clicked it. Let's start again. I'm a storyteller and I would like to tell you a few personal stories about what I like to call the danger of the single story. I grew up on a university campus in Eastern Nigeria. My mother says that I started reading at the age of two, although I think four is probably close to the truth. So I was an early reader and what I read were British and American children's books. I was also an early writer. And when I began to write at about the age of seven, stories in pencil with crayon illustrations that my poor mother was obligated to read, I wrote exactly the kinds of stories I was reading. All my characters were white and blue-eyed. They played in the snow. They ate apples. <clears throat> I'm a storyteller and I would like to tell you a few personal stories about and what I read were British and American children's books. I was also an early writer and when I began to write at about the age of seven, stories in pencil with crayon illustrations that my poor mother was obligated to read, I wrote exactly the kinds of stories I was reading. All my characters were white and blue-eyed. They played in the snow. They ate apples. <clears throat> and they talked a lot about the weather, how lovely it was that the sun had come out. <laughs> now this, despite the fact that I lived in Nigeria, had never been outside Nigeria. We didn't have snow. We ate mangoes, and we never talked about the weather because there was no need to. My characters also drank a lot of ginger beer because the characters in the British books I read drank ginger beer. Never mind that I had no idea what ginger beer was. <laughs> and for many years afterwards, I would have a desperate desire to taste ginger beer. But that is another story. What this demonstrates, I think, is how impressionable and vulnerable we are in the face of a story, particularly as children. Because all I had read were books in which characters were foreign, I had become convinced that books by their very nature had to have foreigners in them and had to be about things with which I could not personally identify. Now things changed when I discovered African books. There weren't many of them available and they weren't quite as easy to find as the foreign books, but because of writers like Chinua Achebe and Kamara Laie, 
I went through a mental shift in my perception of literature. I realized that people like me, girls with skin the color of chocolate, whose kinky hair could not form ponytails, could also exist in literature. I started to write about things I recognized. Now, I loved those American and British books I read. They stirred my imagination, they opened up new worlds for me. But the unintended consequence was that I did not know that people like me could exist in literature. So what the discovery of African writers did for me was this. It saved me from having a single story of what books are. I come from a conventional middle-class Nigerian family. My father was a professor. My mother was an administrator. And so we had, as was the norm, living domestic help who would often come from nearby rural villages. So the year I turned eight, we got a new houseboy. His name was Fide. The only thing my mother told us about him was that his family was very poor. My mother sent yams and rice and our old clothes to his family. And when I didn't finish my dinner, my mother would say, finish your food. Don't you know people like Fide's family have nothing? So I felt enormous pity for Fide's family. Then one Saturday, we went to his village to visit. And his mother showed us a beautifully patterned basket made of dyed raffia that his brother had made. I was startled. It had not occurred to me that anybody in his family could actually make something. All I had heard about them was how poor they were, so that it had become impossible for me to see them as anything else but poor. Their poverty was my single story of them. Years later, I thought about this when I left Nigeria to go to university in the United States. I was 19. My American roommate was shocked by me. She asked where I had learned to speak English so well and was confused when I said that Nigeria happened to have English as its official language. She asked if she could listen to what she called my tribal music and was consequently very disappointed when I produced my tape of Mariah Carey. <laughs> <laughs> she assumed that I did not know how to use a stove. What struck me was this, she had felt sorry for me even before she saw me. Her default position toward me as an African was a kind of patronizing, well-meaning pity. My roommate had a single story of Africa, a single story of catastrophe. In this single story, there was no possibility of Africans being similar to her in any way, no possibility of feelings more complex than pity, no possibility of a connection as human equals. I must say that before I went to the US, I didn't consciously identify as African. But in the US, whenever Africa came up, people turned to me, never mind that I knew nothing about places like Namibia. But I did come to embrace this new identity, and in many ways, I think of myself now as African, although I still get quite irritable when Africa is referred to as a country, the most recent example being my otherwise wonderful flight from Lagos two days ago in which um, there was an announcement on the Virgin flight about their charity walk in India, Africa and other countries. So after I had spent some years in the US as an African, I began to understand my roommate's response to me. If I had not grown up in Nigeria, and if all I knew about Africa were from popular images, I too would think that Africa was a place of beautiful landscapes, beautiful animals, and incomprehensible people fighting senseless wars, dying of poverty and AIDS, unable to speak for themselves, and waiting to be saved by a kind white foreigner. I would see Africans in the same way that I, as a child, had seen Fide's family. This single story of Africa ultimately comes, I think, from Western literature. Now, here's a quote from the writing of a London merchant called John Locke, who sailed to West Africa in 1561 and kept a fascinating account of his voyage. After referring to the black Africans as beasts who have no houses, he writes, they are also people without heads, having their mouths and eyes in their breasts. Now, I've laughed every time I've read this, and one must admire the imagination of John Locke. But what is important about his writing is that it represents the beginning of a tradition of telling African stories in the West. 
A tradition of sub-Saharan Africa as a place of negatives, of difference, of darkness, of people who, in the words of the wonderful poet, <coughs> Rudyard Kipling, are half devil, half child. And so I began to realize that my American roommate must have, throughout her life, seen and heard different versions of this single story. As had a professor who once told me that my novel was not authentically African. Now, I was quite willing to contend that there were a number of things wrong with the novel, that it had failed in a number of places, but I had not quite imagined that it had failed at achieving something called African authenticity. In fact, I did not know what African authenticity was. The professor told me that my characters were too much like him, an educated and middle-class man. My characters drove cars. They were not starving. Therefore, they were not authentically African. But I must quickly add that I too am just as so I want to just end that there um, and hope that you've got a bit of a sense of that and let us kind of perhaps go into a breakout room now for um, I'm going to make it kind of really short just because we really don't have a lot of time but it gives you a bit of a chance to have a little bit of a chat about that and what that what that means what you think that means so if um, this is what you know, you're going to be you're being asked to do. If you could share the um, Padlet, please, link in the chat. Yep, that's shared now. Okay, so if we can then, um, if everybody will click on the Padlet link before they go, um, we we'll give you like um, really normally I'd give you at least seven, but I'm probably going to cut it to five today. Um, this is just about kind of getting us a feel of of what we would have gone through in our process. So if you could just click on that link and then maybe just go into the to the breakout room and then maybe just start thinking about maybe having a conversation um, around that um, that issue. Um, and then we're going to come back in, in, in five minutes. Please don't feel uncomfortable. I, I see that I've got I've lost some people um, and I, I just want to kind of give you a sense of the, the, the need to kind of discuss and to think about these these issues in terms of having a space to talk having a space to talk it's not quite the same as in our team but it starts to give you a sense of how we engage in these in these conversations so um hopefully we can send people to breakout rooms yeah okay so welcome back everybody sorry i know that's a really short amount of time to try to kind of get to know people and try to do this type of work but this really is only about trying to give you that bit of an opportunity to see what it might look like potentially if you try to implement something like this in your own institution. So if we look at the Padlet, uh, we, we can see we've had a couple of things um, popped in. Um, so you've got um, a couple of people saying don't always realise that you're only seeing one side of the story until you're presented with another viewpoint. Uh, you won't notice other stories unless something makes you aware of them. So we need to add more texts with different opinions to our collections and reading lists to make other stories obvious. Uh, and we need to think about challenging our terminology, I suppose, and probably the way that we... So this is just a few things that have come through. If people want to keep adding things, they can do. The key, the key point here is that you're starting to kind of perhaps think about this from the perspective of what stories have been told, what stories haven't been told, and that decolonization is about kind of looking at, at actually what are the stories that have been told and what's missing? What are those stories that have not been told uh, and, that, and the perspectives that have not been told? And, and how do, and, and, and what do, how has the colonial project or the colonial experience ensured that certain types of stories were told or were privileged? And why is that? And what do we need to do as professionals to address that? So, so that's the purpose behind that kind of an exercise to help people to, to feel as though they're starting to come to grips with it. Right, I'm just going to close that off. Um, I hope that, that you found that uh, that particular um, um, 
approach useful. Now, we don't have a lot of time, so it's really quite hard trying to, to showcase the range of things that have happened in, in this project, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on uh, to another one. So um, barriers and opportunities supporting decolonization at your institution. Can you just share the Padlet for, for me uh, again for this? Um, so we're not going to go into breakout rooms, obviously. Um, but in this case, what we will be doing is trying to help people to kind of think, I think it came through, didn't it? But um, we've got quite a, a lot of people who don't really feel confident about um, exploring these topics of decolonization. And, and at the heart of it is trying to understand, well, what are the barriers that you that you're faced with? What are these barriers that are impacting you and, 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 and causing a problem? And actually sharing those in an anonymous Padlet. Um, uh, and what are the opportunities that you perhaps see? And I think, again, sharing that through an anonymous Padlet and then coming up with themes out of that and coming up with ways to discuss that. Because oftentimes what we find is that it's not just you that's feeling these things. There are other people feeling the same things, but we don't actually articulate them to, to, to other people. So we feel as though it's, it's us on our own and we just kind of keep to ourselves and say nothing about it and hope it will all go away. Uh, and so it, this provides a space for you to do that, an anonymous space, a safe space and an opportunity to kind of get a, a, a better understanding of what's happening with your peers. So if you want to just add in, I'm not to say, not putting um, you to go to breakout rooms because we just don't have the time. But what I would suggest is perhaps think about adding in some things if you can. Uh, and this is a space as, as well to reflect on what are those barriers and those opportunities. So once you're doing that, um, I'm just going to move on. So we won't get that opportunity to do the, the actual breakout room um, side of it. But one of the things that we did was once we had done the, the, the initial breakout room, looking at these barriers and, and opportunities, we looked at the Padlet that, that was created. We created a, a list of themes and then we had a specific session just looking at the barriers and the um, the barriers and the opportunities. Uh, and then we were able to start exploring, well, how, how can we address these barriers and opportunities? And, you know, what often happened was that people came with their own, um, their own ideas, <coughs> excuse me, of how um, others, their own solutions. And that's really, really helpful um, in, in this kind of context, because you're then learning from your colleagues, uh, and you have you, it starts to engage people in conversations within these sessions and outside of the sessions. So one of the other things that we sought to do was to develop buy-in about our library offer and messaging. And so one of the things that we did was we created, uh, I'll just take this back to this, this. One of the things we did was to start thinking about uh, creating documents, writing a document that outlined, you know, what might be the best way that we could approach academics and get the conversation going with our academics. And one of those ways was to, you know, identify champions, identify, start trying to identify champions, start trying to get engaged uh, and find out who's involved in this type of work. You know, is there an EDI committee that you can get involved with or that you can find out who the chair is? Um, you know, trying to get yourself, build those standard relationships that we often do build, um, as library professionals with colleagues and certainly do uh, in the liaison librarian role and try and build those relationships so that you can actually start having one-on-one -on -one conversations and find out actively what people are doing and what have been some of the challenges and having the discussions. Often when you do have those conversations, what you'll find is that the same kinds of issues that you've been feeling about in terms of barriers, oftentimes you know, around confidence and uh, feeling awkward maybe in terms of talking about these things with colleagues, being concerned about the way in which they might react to you. All these kinds of things are things that they're also experiencing from some of their colleagues as well. So, you know, you start building a relationship uh, about around somebody who's really interested. So 
one of the other things that we did was we also created a live, started to look at library offers based on consultation with um, um, some um, some colleagues, some academic colleagues um, that had indicated an interest in being involved in at an early stage. And we were able to identify some core areas that we might be able to do some work to, to offer a range of, of, of uh, services uh, and ways of engaging with decolonization and decolonizing the curriculum. And so one of the things that we did um, was then once we'd identified each of these, so you can see them across the top, one, two, three, four, five. So one of the things that we did was we were able then to start thinking, well, actually, what would that look like? How would we deliver that? What do we need to do in order to make that happen? And then once people um, had um, identified things and that they could, um, that they would suggest, uh, and we, we are, I asked them to kind of like, to, to like the, the ones that they, they really like. And that gave us, or has given us, uh, an opportunity to understand, you know, what, what, we, what are perceived to be the priority areas from the team. So we're building a shared understanding, a shared buy-in about how we're going to go move forward, how we're going to go forward. So... Again, time being short, I'm just going to go to lessons learned from the project to date, just to kind of uh, make you aware. There's quite a bit, but you'll get get most of it in the uh, you get it through the slides. Um, so, create a team culture. Uh, so, lessons learned, development or support of team culture. This is really important. If your team is really supportive and, and says it's okay that you don't understand as you can see from the polls many people are at different stages of their learning journey so if if that is the situation which it will be in most institutions a team culture which signals that it's okay is really supportive to those people to a variety of people to everybody let's everybody know look we're all going to work on this together we're all going to move forward together uh, and, and, and it's okay that people are at different stages. So you're not expected to know everything. Providing a supportive environment where staff can feel safe to share their concerns um, and be their authentic selves. So that whole thing with the barriers and the concerns, and I hope some of you are able to put in some of your barriers and, and opportunities into that Padlet, because it would be really useful um, to share, I think, as an outcome of this project. You know, not feeling judged and that is really 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 important you know that people feel that way that sustained trust because you need to have um a, that that feeling that you can actually be honest about where you are and build confidence uh and and i um, through identifying solutions and and often those solutions come through sharing your experiences in those uh, breakout rooms through padlets through other uh, mechanisms and then um, you you realize that other people have got them have got the same um, issues or challenges or that you can offer something to help them to 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 address or deal with um, how they have been uh, an issue that they phrase you've got support in the development of knowledge so provide ways to showcase the staff that decolonization is aligned with the university strategic objectives. Support staff to develop um, their understanding. This is really important, actually, really making sure that people feel that they understand that they've got a green light to get engaged in this work in their institution. And I hope that this is the case in your institution, that you can find some strategic drivers to, to support you and, and even look for statements that the VC is saying or other senior members of staff are saying around decolonisation, because some people will be hesitant about getting involved in these initiatives. Um, so, as I said, about support, developing the understanding, understanding of decolonization over time. We can't do it just um, one time. A one-time shot doesn't work. It's got to be repeatedly coming back and building on, the, on, on your understanding over time. Um, provide opportunities for staff to learn how decolonization is being supported at Liverpool, uh, well, I've got at Liverpool, but from any institution, from invited speakers. So we invited our um, teaching and learning um, um, uh, 
people so the people who who provide guidance and to to, uh, to um staff around teaching and learning and, and what we did with them was was they, they talked about our inclusive curriculum they talked about you know the way in which uh, our inclusive curriculum toolkit and in other words how it how it fits how all this fits together and then most recently we've had a student voice session where we've got students that we uh, from some departments that we have been working with that have been doing decolonization projects to provide the student voice all of this helps to build confidence and support for staff and an understanding of how decolonization is being rolled out across the institution. Create spaces to continue the conversation. I'm going to have to stop, I know. Teams channels, yeah, and yeah. Teams channels and Padlet. So there's a lot of, of things here. I've also talked about the pedagogy here. So you've got that. And you've also got about the, the organization, the need to make sure that you've got team members who are supportive um of the initiative they don't have to have as much knowledge as as uh, uh together but they do need to be supportive uh, and just very quickly what have you learned today if you could just share that poll for me uh and then people can can kind of fill that out as it is and, and i'll share the the responses um at the end so i'm, I'm really sorry about that no, no worries. Thank you so much, Shirley. And I'm sorry that we've had to had to cut you off there. Um, but um, please, people, feel free to continue these discussions in the lounges, which can be accessed at the top of the Hublot platform. Um, and Shirley, as well, if you'd like to to join one of those and discuss further with people there, you're yes, more than welcome. I'm happy to go into the to the lounge. Yeah. That would be fantastic. So we've got um, until 3.15 for um, networking and, and breaking out into the lounges before the next session at 3.15, uh, which is going to be our gold sponsor presentation from Cortex, building a case for free e-textbooks at the University of Derby. Um, we also have a feedback survey which will be going out at the end of each day of the conference. So um, we would really appreciate everybody, everybody's feedback in that. Um, and yeah, I think we are going to wrap up there. Thank you so much again, Shirley. Absolutely a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you.